hiney, 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 brothers got the hiney, 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 brothers got the hiney, hiney. At work, at home, or on the road, you deserve great coffee. A Heine Brothers coffee subscription plan gives you top quality organic and fair trade coffee delivered right to your door or office automatically. You select the frequency, the quantity, and the variety of coffee, and Heine Brothers will take care of the rest, shipping included. Also makes a great gift, so order online at HeineBrosCoffee.com. That's H-E-I-N-E-B-R-O-S-C-O-F-F-E-E.com forward slash subscription and use the offer code the past for five dollars off any gift subscription hello everybody and welcome to the past and the curious my name is mick sullivan i'm the host and creator of this here program and i'm excited to share it with you this is episode number 32 and because it's tied to a book that I've been working on. You could say this episode is years in the making. Um, we have a very special guest. Our friend Mr. Eric from What If World is going to be here. I was just on his show uh, this month as well, so you should go check that out. It was a whole lot of fun. Uh, he's going to be reading a story about the Boston Molasses Flood, the Great Molasses Disaster, which is appropriate because Mr. Eric is actually from Boston. Also, I will be sharing with you the story finally, you're saying finally, of the Kentucky Meat Shower, the weird event in 1876. You'll find out more about it, and if you are interested in the book, you can find out more about that at the end. Uh, it features the voices of Dan Sachs from Noodle Loaf and Brennan Power from Book Power for Kids, so thanks to those guys. Here we go. Business regulation. Are there any more exciting words in the English language? If so, I'd like to hear them. No, I mean, really, I'd like to hear them because legal rules for businesses doesn't really sound like fun at all. But before your eyes glaze over from words you might hear a lawyer or a politician say, let me explain it like this. You know that exit sign you see above doors in every public building you've ever entered? As you surely know, those are there to make sure you can find your way out in case there's an emergency. But what you might not have considered is that those signs weren't always there. It took tragic events like fires in American factories where people couldn't get out for the government to say, You know what? From now on, buildings need to have several easy ways to get down to the street level, and all exit paths must be clearly marked. Seems like a no-brainer, but it took some terrible events happening in the early 1900s for this to become a law. By the way, I'm not convinced that America got it right. Exit signs are supposed to be an emergency guide for everyone, right? This includes people who may not be able to read English. Maybe that's a kid. Maybe that's someone from another country. Whatever the case, I think it's just a bit confusing that Americans plastered that big, harsh word exit in bright red, which everyone knows is the international color for, you know, stop! If you're listening beyond America, you may be glowing with pride right now over your exit signs, which probably feature the picture of a green stick figure running towards an exit. This is known as the Green Running Man, and it's a logical choice, since green is the international color for, you know, go. Anyway, exit signs weren't the only regulation to come about because of tragedy. The era known as the Progressive Era was chock full of rules being created to protect workers and citizens, from the railroad to meatpacking plants. And you do not want me to go into what happened while people were making hot dogs and bologna at the turn of the century. But one of the most unusual things to happen at this time happened because a Boston business owner wanted to save money on a giant storage tank. The north end of Boston was said to have been one of the most crowded places in the United States, and perhaps the world, in 1919. The area was filled with dock workers, merchants, day laborers, and immigrant families who had recently arrived from all over Europe. As boats came and went from the bustling wharf, as families hung their laundry out to dry, and as children played every day, they all did so in the shadow of a gigantic tank which dominated the neighborhood skyline. 
Some days, if you listened closely, this giant steel tank seemed to groan and moan with a low-pitched wail. No one seemed to think much about it, except for the occasional employee who would get shush if he spoke up about the tank not being safe. The steel tank was built in 1915 by the United States Industrial Alcohol Company, and when the cylindrical tank was finished, it was 50 feet tall and 90 feet wide. Unfortunately, the walls of the tank were not very thick, and it was belted together with iron riveted belts. I say unfortunately because, in the end, this was not strong enough to hold the weight of the 2.3 million gallons of liquid that could fit inside. What liquid did it hold, you ask? Well, it wasn't milk. It wasn't water. But it was something you might have in your kitchen. It was molasses. In England, they call it dark treacle. And if you're unfamiliar, it is a sweet, sticky, dark syrup that you get when you process raw sugar. It has a lot of uses. You might mix it in your ginger snap cookies or muffins. It can also be distilled to create rum. But in this case, the company's main business was distilling it to pure alcohol to be used in explosives, like dynamite. It might seem a little weird that something you put on your pancakes could actually be used to make dynamite, but such is the marvel of science. And I don't think it's possible, but just in case, you might want to be careful the next time you've got molasses around at breakfast. It'd be bad news if your ooey gooey went kablooey. Millions of gallons of non-explosive molasses regularly traveled from the sugar fields of the Caribbean islands. Those gallons bound for Boston were offloaded via a heated tube from the wharf to the tank, like something out of Willy Wonka's factory. And for about four years, this tank would hold the valuable syrup before it would be moved elsewhere to be distilled into something less sweet and more explosive. Sometimes the tank would be more full than others, and at these times the seams, the base, and even the riveted holes would leak the syrup. When this happened, the clever sweet-toothed neighborhood kids would gather around using sticks to dab the tasty syrup, which they would lick all day long, like any of us would do with what was basically an unlimited supply of candy. It wasn't all licking sticks and sugary goodness, though. The leaky tank raised a few eyebrows. One worker pointed out the brown stains on the tank to his boss, believing that this was clear evidence that the tank was getting weak and wasn't going to be able to hold the molasses much longer. His boss's answer, Panic, Ray. Then it'll look good as no. But was the worried worker wrong? Oh, he was worse than wrong. He was right. In January of 1919, an enormous shipment of molasses was due on a ship from the Caribbean. If they didn't put the syrupy shipment in the tank, there'd be nowhere else to put it. And if that was the case, the ship would simply unload it where it sat. If this was going to happen, the same water that was once filled with British tea during the revolutionary Boston Tea Party would be filled again, but this time with molasses. So the company made the bad decision to load the tank to the tippy top. The giant tank, now completely loaded with 2.3 million gallons of molasses, did not like this one bit. Only now it didn't moan and groan. It practically screamed. At one o'clock in the afternoon on January 15th, witnesses reported hearing a tremendous snap. The iron belt holding the flimsy steel walls together ruptured, sending rivets flying and causing the walls to split like a too tight pair of loud metal pants. But instead of embarrassing underwear falling out of the tear, it was something much more dangerous. As you might guess, the result was a wave of molasses. And I mean a tidal wave. It was the gushiest gush of gooey, gross glucose you could imagine. And I can imagine an awful lot. 2,300,000 gallons of molasses is a lot of molasses. And though you might picture its creeping slow dribble when you're trying to get it out of your jar in the kitchen, that was not the case this day with the pressure all of that molasses was under. The giant wave was 15 feet tall and moved at 35 miles per hour. It did some serious damage. Houses were leveled. 
the elevated train bridge was damaged, and lives were lost. Despite everyone's grave concerns about the moaning, groaning giant tank casting a shadow over the neighborhood while leaking molasses with slow dribbles, the company in charge did nothing. They ignored warning signs, they didn't listen to concerns from workers and citizens, and when the molasses finally hit the fan in an entire neighborhood was destroyed by the syrupy explosion, it was too late. Because it's so unusual, the Boston Molassacre is easy to laugh at today. But it really was a tragedy and lives were deeply affected, which was why the company was sued. This event was the first time in America that a group of citizens banded together to sue a company. It's called a class action lawsuit. And though it took five years, the citizens of Boston won and were awarded money for their losses. Also, it made the government aware of the problems that can come when companies are more concerned with making money than the safety and well-being of citizens in their community. Because of this, tougher laws and more in-depth inspections became a requirement. And can you imagine the cleanup of the molasses flood? It took hundreds of people months to cart that mess away. For decades afterwards, people said you could still smell the sweet scent of molasses on a hot summer day. From the creators of the popular science show with millions of YouTube subscribers comes the Minute Earth podcast. Every episode of the show dives deep into a science question you might not even know you had. But once you hear the answer, you'll want to share it with everyone you know. Why do rivers curve? Why did the T-Rex have such tiny arms? And why do so many more kids need glasses now than they used to? Spoiler alert, it isn't screen time. Our team of scientists digs into the research and breaks it down into a short, entertaining explanation jam-packed with science facts and terrible puns. Subscribe to Minute Earth wherever you like to listen. Hi, friends. Are you looking for a storytime podcast with your littles? Something that has some great storytelling and maybe some conversation about it? Look no further. With Storytime with Philip and Mommy, my little guy Philip and I sit down every single day and read a story together. And we, of course, want you to join us. Grab your copy of the book, sit down, let's read it, and let's talk about it. We'll learn new words, we'll learn new ideas, and then we'll learn how we can use those stories in our lives. It's a lot of fun. Classics like Little Golden Books or Bernstein Bears, all the way up through the newest phenomenons like Bluey. We talk about them and we have a lot of laughs. It's a great time and we hope that you can come and join us. So please look for us and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Storytime with Philip and Mommy. Thanks so much. We'll see you there. I love the You Have 30 Seconds segment and we have a new one this month from Bella. Ready, set, go. Hello, Mick. This is me, Bella. I wanted to tell you about Frida Kahlo, the Mexican artist, because she was artistic like me. First, she wanted to be a doctor, and then she got hit by a bus. Then she realized she wanted to paint. My favorite work of art by Frida is a self-portrait she did in 1932 with pastels and charcoal. I like her face and beautiful flowers. She was born in 1907 and died in 1954. Oh, I love Frida Kahlo. How did you know, Bella? Thank you so much. If you have somebody you want to tell us about or something, we want to hear from you. You have 30 seconds. You can go to thepastandthecurious.com to get the very simple instructions and ask your parents to help you do so. Thank you very much. Instead of a silly joke before quiz time, I'm going to use this opportunity to say hello to my friends in New York, Moxie and Frank. Hey, y'all. It was nice to meet you. It's quiz time. It's quiz time. It's quiz time. You heard it? Let's do it. Here we go. During World War II, Great Britain found themselves running low on certain foods. There was a need for space on the refrigerated ships coming into port, so some foods were banned in order to save space for more important things. One of these foods was bananas. But some creative people made mock bananas out of a what vegetable? The idea of living without bananas was a nightmare for Britons. So a common recipe as a replacement was sugar, banana flavoring, and boiled parsnips. 
Did the root vegetable do the trick to satisfy banana cravings? No, by most accounts, it was not a delicious dish. Question number two. Do you know what cold sweet treat Frank Epperson invented by mistake in 1905 when he was just 11 years old? At first, it was called an epsicle, and it happened when he left a sweet drink on his porch, along with the stick he had used to mix it up. That night, it got cold, cold enough to freeze, and the next day, when he pulled the stick out, the frozen drink came with it. Legend has it that they became known as Pop's Sickles when he made them for his grandchildren many years later. Question number three. In 1938, Ruth Graves Wakefield made history while working at a restaurant called the Toll House Inn. What are we grateful to her for inventing? Well, I don't know about you, but I am grateful to her because she made the very first chocolate chip cookies. One legend says that she thought the chocolate bits she put in the batter would melt and make chocolate cookies. But she clearly stated that this was not the case. She was just a cookie visionary and knew the chocolate chips would change the world. The story you are about to hear is true. These are real people real events, and real chunks. The names have not been changed to protect the innocent. And over the next few minutes, you will hear a mystery which remains to this day. If you know something, or if you think you can help, we the people of the past and the curious call on you, the citizens of the world, to help us find an answer. An answer to what? You'll find out next on this very special episode of Unsolved Meat Stories. Our story begins in a small library museum in Lexington, Kentucky, a town which was founded in 1775 and has been home not just to Henry Clay and Mary Todd, who married and buried a man named Abraham Lincoln, but also to actor George Clooney and chess grandmaster Gregor Kadanov. In the years since its founding, the city has developed a fascination with basketball and racehorses, and it is also home to Transylvania University, which, no, is not where Dracula attended his undergrad. It was the first university in the state of Kentucky, and contained in the collection at the university's museums are several unusual items, many of which were used to educate early medical students. There are skeletons, there are models of medical abnormalities, but also rolling around the place is what is believed to be the largest hairball in the world. A gigantic 14-inch dense furry ball that was found in the stomach of a buffalo. This bezoar was given to the school by Mary Todd Lincoln's little brother. And of course, Harry Potter fans might recognize that word, bezoar. This is another name for hairballs such as this. These strange formations from the stomachs of animals were at one time believed to be an antidote to poison. But as strange as this hairball might seem, it is not the strangest thing here. That honor is reserved for a small jar containing a very old, very plain piece of meat. It might not strike you as strange upon first sight, but when you learn its origin, or rather, mysterious lack of a clear origin, well, you'll find the most unusual story this side of the Ohio River. You see, the story goes like this. On March 3rd of 1876, this very piece of meat fell from the sky above. And it wasn't alone. It fell like a squishy, sinewy snow. Or perhaps a medium rare rain, surrounded by countless other pieces of meaty flakes and chewy chunks. Undoubtedly, you realize this is not something meat typically does. And we'd argue further, that this is not something meat should ever do. But the evidence that day indicates that, well, it did. Meat fell from the sky. And naturally, your questions are how and why. Well, dude, we just don't know. 
Here is part of an actual quote from the New York Times recounting the event. News flash! On last Friday, a shower of meat fell near the house of Alan Crouch, covering a strip of ground about 100 yards in length and 50 yards wide. Mrs. Crouch was out in the yard at the time, engaged in making soap, when meat which looked like beef began to fall around her. The sky was perfectly clear at the time, and she said it fell like large snowflakes. One piece fell near her, which was three or four inches square. The article describes a scene of mystery meat stuck to fences and scattered around the ground, and then concludes with this stinger. Two gentlemen who tasted the meat expressed the opinion that it was either mutton or venison. You heard that, right? They ate it. We'll get back to the people who ate the meat in a moment. Because they were not alone, which is super, super gross. But first, let's reiterate the main point here. Meat fell from the sky. I can't say that enough. The meat covered the same amount of space as a football field today and left everyone perplexed. Never before in history had such a thing happened. Or at least, never had people seen it happen before, I guess. It's like that old saying, if meat falls from the sky and no one's around to eat it, did it actually fall? That's how that goes, right? As we've said, the New York Times covered it, but they weren't alone. The crazy story appeared in newspapers, journals, and magazines across the country, and some even dispatched reporters to travel to the -the out-of-the-way Crouch Farm for interviews and observations. People wanted answers about how meat could just fall from the sky. Samples of the sky meat were packed up in jars and sent to labs in the hopes that scientists could come up with an explanation for the mystery. But in the 1870s, Science just wasn't advanced enough to answer such an important question with certainty. But that didn't stop people from coming up with some incredible ideas. One scientist believed that it was not meat at all, but a bacteria known as Nostoc. This is also referred to as star jelly or witch's butter. It's an unnoticeable flaky material which can absorb rain and expand into a gelatinous blubbery material if it rains but there were no reports of any rain on March 3rd. Another person speculated that it was meat, horse meat, and that a recently deceased horse had exploded. Perhaps they had considered the thing that happens to beached whales after the decomposing gases build up in the carcass. It's been known to happen. In fact, we'd recommend checking out our hot dog episode if you want a really fun decomposing whale story. But that's one thing. Exploding horses are pretty unusual. It's possible one poor horse may have exploded, but no one reported missing any equine, so we are not convinced. Other people said it wasn't a natural occurrence at all, but instead a practical joke that someone was playing, either the couches themselves or someone else who wanted to get their goose, as they say. As is the case with most unusual occurrences, some people believe that it was supernatural. But if you ask us, the most likely scenario is that the meat did in fact fall from above. But rather than being roused by the winds, or falling from the heavens, or rained from the clouds, it vaulted from the mouths of vultures. And we're not alone in thinking this. There were people in the area at the time who believed that this was the explanation too. You see, vultures, by their nature, are a very social bird, which is pretty unusual for a bird of their size. You also might know that vultures feed on carrion, which is a fancy way of saying that they love to eat the decaying flesh of dead animals. Which sounds pretty gross, but when you consider where this is going, there's plenty of room to get grosser. Vultures, see, they aren't predators, they are scavengers, with an incredible sense of smell. And when the sweet, sweet smell of rotten flesh leads them to carrion, the birds (laughs) feast in a large group called a wake. Then, the wake of vultures might sit around for a while and let the rotten meat digest. And if that's the case, the group of stationary, non-eating vultures is called a committee of vultures. Interestingly, the name for their group changes with the activity that they are doing. When the vultures fly, they cease to be awake, and they cease to be a committee, and they become a kettle of vultures. Which finally gets us to the other possible explanation for the meat shower of 1876 a wake of vultures had eaten, and rather than sit and digest as a committee, the group, for some reason, found it necessary to fly. With the kettle high in the sky, one of those airborne vultures might have found it necessary to lighten his load, if you know what I mean. 
It's a peculiar defense mechanism the birds have, but it is not uncommon for such an occurrence to start a chain reaction. Another way to say it is that if one of these airborne birds barfs, they all barf. And perhaps on this day in 1876, a huge kettle of vultures all stuffed with food simultaneously barfed somewhere above the Crouch farm, right onto poor Mrs. Crouch. But we're not sure. Another scientist tested the meat and said that it was something a little more human. Let's hope not. Another newspaper, the New York Herald, went so far as to send a reporter to the area, not just to see the meat rain for himself, but also to talk to a few people in town. Benjamin F. Ellington, an old trapper who had eaten his fair share of meats while working in the wilderness out west, tasted it, and he had no doubt about what it was. Gentlemen, I've fed bears and other varmints in this range of mountains for over 30 years. And when a bear crosses my path in the timber, one of our skins has got to come off before the dispute is ended. I have seen some of this meat that's fallen on old man Crouch's farm. And then if it's meat at all, it's bear meat. Now, I've scunned more bears and charred more of that kind of meat than any other man in this part of the United States. Gentlemen, it's bar meat, or else my name is not Benjamin Franklin Ellington. But was Mr. Ellington right? Oh, he was worse than right. He was wrong. Or rather... Maybe right and maybe wrong, which is kind of worse. You see, in the 143 years that have rolled by since the March 3rd, 1876 event, no one has figured out what happened. It's a mystery that people have wondered about for decades. All of the specimens have disappeared, being lost to time. One piece, however, lives in a jar in Lexington, Kentucky, at Transylvania University, not far from the world's largest hairball. We've learned that the meat recently traveled to Europe for some state-of-the-art gene sequencing in hopes that it could finally be identified. We have not heard the results of this study, and personally, I hope we never figure it out. A mystery is where the fun is. Science can explain pretty much anything today, but back in 1876, this just wasn't the case, so people wondered. And 143 years later, we can still wonder today. It's good to wonder. Okay, as promised, uh, we're going to end this episode with a very special interview. We're, we're excited to welcome a special guest to the show, um, none other than author of The Meat Shower, Mick Sullivan. Welcome, Mick. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me on, Mick. It's really, it's a pleasure to be here. The pleasure is all mine, I assure you. But let me ask, why a book about this meat? Oh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, this is an event that still goes unsolved and no one has really come up with an answer that satisfies everybody. And I think that's really neat that to this day and age, we can still look back on something that science hasn't explained yet and we can wonder about it. And I think that's a really powerful thing. But when we wrote the book, we, we loved the event, but we were looking for an interesting way to tell it. And so we wanted to tell it from the perspective of that piece of meat. So we made him the narrator of the story, the one piece of meat that's in the museum jar. Everyone's looking for an answer to this question, but he deserves one more than anybody because it's the reason that he's here the whole time. We thought it was a really fun idea to make him the star. We rolled out the red carpet for him. That you did. I've never felt connected to a piece of meat like that before in my life. What was the process like? Oh, it was a great process. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, I worked with my friend Shay Goodlett, and we met about three years ago through a mutual friend and became great friends through the process and really had a, a fun time working on it. He's a really great illustrator. It's really vibrant and alive, um, sort of almost like a like a graphic novel or a comic, but really colorful as well and real stark, dark lines it's 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 really really cool um and we had a lot of fun putting jokes in the in the illustrations too there's there's a two-page spread of vultures vomiting which is absolutely my favorite but also a lot more subtle humor uh it, it's i think people will really like it of all ages kids middle grade and adults oh unquestionably so people are going to want to know where they can get the book oh man you're like barbara walters with the questions it's so great um 
Yeah, people can get it a number of ways. Uh, it's currently available now in my hometown of Louisville uh, at places like the Fraser History Museum, where I spend my days as a as a employee. Um, but also, uh, it will be available at Carmichael's Bookstore, and it's also available online right now through the publisher Early Works Press. Uh, their website is earlyworkspress.com, and you can just click the shop button and you'll find it there. It'll be on Amazon very soon as well, probably by the end of the month. We just wanted to give the independent and the early businesses a uh, first shot at it because we love su- supporting indie businesses. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I'd like to add that, you know, our show is is often about people who did really important things or famous people or not so famous people who did really important things. And this doesn't necessarily line up with that because it's just some weird event when meat fell from the sky, but it's just something that I've always been fascinated with and always been looking for a way to share with people in a new way. And Shay's illustrations and our fun that we had together, it was just a perfect way to do it. And, um, I think, I think it'll help people appreciate more about the world around them. Uh, and also, you know, just get a, get a laugh and enjoy something and, surprisingly fall in love hopefully with a book that's narrated by a 143 year old piece of meat i mean if nothing else it's the only book in the entire history of the world that can say that we actually had a reading for the launch this past saturday and it was so rewarding to look around the room as i was reading the book and see a bunch of children following along unprompted uh, on the book's that they had in their hands too which was really really awesome and then the thought occurred to me that had some vultures not vomited 143 years ago, none of this ever would have happened. Uh, it took something like that. Talk about butterfly effect. It took something like vulture vomit 143 years ago, or supposed vulture vomit. We're not sure. Uh, it took that to bring everybody together. It was really, really amazing. Well, and with that chunk of wisdom, we'll say goodbye. Thank you for being here, Mick. It was really a pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you so much. I can't wait to be back. You can find out more about Mick Sullivan's new book, illustrated by Shay Goodlett, at thepastandthecurious.com, earlyworkspress.com, and soon on Amazon. And the book is vegetarian-friendly. All right, thanks for putting up with that, guys. You have to admit, that was a pretty good interview. I need to thank my friend Mr. Eric from What If World. I also need to thank Dan Sachs from Noodle Loaf and Brennan Power from Book Power for Kids. All great kids listen friends. You should check them out. I love them dearly. Speaking of kids, listen, friends, we have a collaboration coming up. Summertime is always really, really hectic for me uh, and the rest of the team that helps with this. Um, And uh, so we're actually going to do a collaboration. I've been talking to Lindsay at Tumble and uh, either probably in July, we're going to do a combo show with her. So it'll be one story from Tumble's repertoire uh, with a new story that that I've written. Uh, Looking forward to that. I also need to thank patreon sponsors chris and cheryl thank you all so much and thanks to you dear listener we're so glad that you join us we hope you find joy in what we're creating we really have a good time doing it uh hope you'll consider the book and hope to hear from you give us your 30 seconds uh send us whatever just let us know you're out there we'd love to hear from you i'm mick sullivan this is the past and the curious